For the past few years, I've had the honor and privilege of leading the organization of the summit, working with amazing staff and team at CBRC, the Summit Programming Committee, and the wonderful community of partners and presenters who all work so hard on making this conference as engaging, accessible, relevant, and as inclusive as possible. In particular, uh, I really need to thank uh, the core summit organizing team, uh, Luke Gray, Keith Reynolds, Jose Patino Gomez, and uh, Chris Dorado. Uh, a, a few folks in particular from the summit programming committee, uh, Sarah Chown, Vincent Musso, and Jesse Dame, who have really stepped up to um, make this year's programming especially powerful, um, and Jumbo Events for their tech and event production expertise and support. Uh, we're, we know that there have been some technical uh, glitches and challenges with the conference, and we really appreciate your patience as we try and do our best to sort of navigate all of those issues and uh, deliver the best conference experience as possible. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our conference sponsors and funders, Vive Healthcare, uh, the presenting partner for the summit, Gilead Sciences Canada, uh, who is the pre-summit series sponsor, and our funders, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada and Women and Gender Equality Canada. Through their support, we are again able to offer free registration and providing um, more opportunities for many more community members and 2SLGBTQ plus health stakeholders in taking part in the conference. Uh, a, seer, a sincere thank you to everyone who has helped make this, uh, this year one of the most dynamic, diverse and intersectional summits yet, reaching our highest ever registration total at nearly a thousand. If you're new to the summit, welcome. I especially encourage you to share your feedback through our various evaluation surveys including one that will go out after the event next week, and consider sharing your work with the Summit community for 2022. More information on next year's conference will be out next spring. Um, so since the start of our pre-summit series last week uh, with our panel exploring ongoing barriers and challenges with PrEP, uh, then our intergenerational HIV dialogue and our reflections panel with last year's keynotes, we've tried to set the stage for the conference theme of Disrupt and Reconstruct. We've had a really incredible first two days of the summit, beginning with our first ever Two-Spirit two Day at the summit and a Two-Spirit gathering just for Two-Spirit and Indigenous queer and trans participants and leaders from across Turtle Island. Um, thank you to everyone who made uh, our first couple of days uh, such a huge success. I've been really blown away by all the sessions that I've been able to participate in so far. And just want to thank all the presenters, moderators, and folks working behind the scenes for their collective efforts in producing a really great conference. And now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome the moderator uh, and introduce the moderator for this plenary session, Chris Dorado. Uh, Christopher Dorado is CBRC's content strategist, and he's worked uh, for more than two decades uh, in communications for nonprofits and queer organizations. Uh, Chris is also the author of two novels. Uh, go check them out, uh, ge The Geography of Pluto and The Family Way. And he's also the founder and host of the Violet Hour Reading Series and Book Club. Chris, please take it away. Thank you, Michael. Um, welcome to everyone uh, who is joining us today. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the lands from which I'm joining today. I am broadcasting from Jajage, otherwise known as Montreal the traditional and unceded territory of the Ganyigahaga. This is uh, actually the place where I first met today's keynote speaker, Kai Cheng Tom. Hello, Kai Cheng. I've long been a fan of your work and uh, was so thrilled uh, that we're going to be hearing from you today. Uh, the title of Kai Cheng's talk um, is Choosing Love at the End of the World, Social Collapse, Conflict Resolution and Queer Resilience. Uh, there will be a few minutes at the end of the session for questions, so be sure to put them in the Q&A box, and we will try to get to them. Just a reminder that you can access the closed captioning and live audio interpretation features for this session by clicking below. I also want to remind people about our community guidelines. They have been created to build a safer, supportive, and inclusive space, and we ask that you please follow them. I'll be putting the link in the chat. Now on to our presenter, uh, Kai Cheng Tom is an award-winning author, performance artist, and community healer. 
a somatically trained coach, consultant, and conflict resolution practitioner. She is also the developer of the Loving Justice methodology and works at the intersection of mind, body, and collective soul. Kai Cheng's latest book, I Hope We Choose Love, A Trans Girl's Notes from the End of the World, which was published by Arsenal Pulp Press in 2019, dives deeply into the topics of transformative justice, prison abolition, trauma-informed activism, and building queer and trans futures. Her aim is to participate in a paradigm shift that moves beyond the simple politics of identity and diversity. Lately, she's been focusing her attention on the ways that trauma and oppression prevent people from building strong, loving relationships, which in turn stops activist movements from creating sustainable interpersonal change. Kai Cheng, I turn things over to you. Wow, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, Michael, and all the organizers and workers who have done so much labor to put this conference together and to all my fellow speakers and presenters, to all of you who are joining today from your various locales. I also am joining from Toronto, also called Toronto, the traditionally stewarded lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and I am honored and delighted to be here to talk about conflict, my favorite thing. You know, I have to tell you that when I was growing up as a little girl, um, I didn't think, oh, I would love to be a conflict resolution person. I'm just so fascinated by how conflict happens in uh, queer and social justice communities. That was really like not on my radar. I wanted to be um, in ascending order of priority, a doctor, because that's what my mom wanted me to be, um, a fireman, because they were kind of hot, and um, an anamorph. Um, and uh, none of those career options worked out, which is why I find myself here in front of you today. I joke, but kind of not really. So <laughs> today's presentation um, is called Choosing Love at the End of the World, Social Collapse, Conflict Resolution, and Queer Resistance. And I'd like to begin by telling you a story. If you were here with me in person, I would probably open this by saying, who's ready for a story? And then you would respond by saying me or something. Um, because you're on Zoom, I can't see or hear any of your reactions. So I'm just gonna um, ask and pretend that you're responding. Who's ready for a story? And maybe a part of you is rising up in response. Maybe you're even, Typing into the chat. Oh, there you go. <laughs> typing, yeah, typing in the chat to tell me you're ready. So let's 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 give it a try. Once upon a time, once upon a time, once upon a time. In a kingdom far, far away, in a time long, long ago, there was a beautiful and mighty spirit whose name is now lost to time. But we think that she was called love. She was also known as the ancient one. And the ancient one came from a place far across the sea and immediately enchanted all who knew her with both her strength and her beauty. But you see that land was ruled by a mighty sun god and a cunning moon goddess whose powers of order ruled the land and they were not willing to so easily give up their dominion. Now, the sun god and the moon goddess were cunning and they were strong, as I have already told you. So they planned together to usurp the power of the ancient one and prevent her from becoming goddess over all the lands. The sun god pretended to be in love with the ancient one. And truth be told, he did not need to try very hard for she was very beautiful and very powerful. And the cunning moon goddess pretended to be the ancient one's friend. The ancient one confided in the moon goddess I'm so in love with the sun god, because she was boy crazy. Um, what should I do? How will I know if our love is real? And the moon goddess told her, take this vial of my tears and drink them before you come to meet. And when you do, you will know whether or not your love is true. So the ancient one went to meet the sun god in her garden beneath the sea. And she drank the vial of tears that the moon goddess had given her. But dear ones, the moon goddess was cunning and she lied. 
the vial of tears put the ancient one to sleep. And as she lay sleeping, the sun god approached and tore her body to pieces. Has you, have you ever heard of such perfidy, dear ones? Have you ever heard of something so treacherous and terrible? But fear not, not all was lost. For the sun god scattered the dismembered pieces of the ancient one's body across the lands, and where they landed, her blood soaked into the earth, and her flesh dissolved, and was eaten by animals, and absorbed by plants. And so too was the blood that spilled into the earth, and so those plants and animals absorbed some of the spirit of the ancient one. And then humans came to eat the plants and the animals, and so they too came to absorb the remnants of the ancient one's body and spirit. And those humans had children, and those children were known. They were marked by their wild, unruly bodies that could not obey the commands of the sun god and moon goddess. They were known by their emotions, so powerful they could bring down the rain and cause storms. Love so strong, it could shake the earth. This story may be starting to sound a little familiar to you now, dear ones. The sun god and the moon goddess were not so ready to accept defeat. They made their plans, the cunning moon goddess and the strong sun god. They told their followers that the children of the ancient one were monstrous, were monsters, would corrupt all the other humans and lead them to their doom. And so the humans who followed the sun god and moon goddess went to hunt the children of the ancient one, haunted them with traps and cages and knives and poisons, the way monsters are always hunted. And so the children of the ancient one learned many different ways to survive. Some learned to alter their forms and appear almost as the other humans, though inside they were still not the same, for they could still hear the song of the ancient one in their bones. Others became vengeful and roamed the earth as phantom spirits, seeking discord and violence, seeking vengeance for their murdered mother. And others traveled all across the lands, seeking a place where there could be safe. And it is this last group whose story I'm going to tell more of today, for that group of the children of the ancient one found themselves over hill, down dale, across rivers, across seas, and together built a village in the mountains. And this village they named after the ancient one, they called this village the village of love. And in the village of love, they built temples to love and libraries to love. They filled those temples and libraries with the songs of love and the poetry of love. And as the generations went by, the children of love came to disagree with one another about the very best way to honor her memory. They came to argue about whether they should become fierce and warlike, like the ancient one's strength, and take back the lands from which they had been driven. Some believed that they should be peaceful and humble and wait until the dominion of the sun god and moon goddess had naturally passed. And others had other beliefs, so strange, so diverse, you would not believe them if I were to tell you now. And so the many factions of the village of love came to war with one another. They came to burn down the library of love and the temple of love. Eventually they burnt down the whole village of love, all in love's name. And the children of love were scattered once more. Some had even harmed one another or killed one another. And this brings us to the end of the story, dear ones. But fear not, for hope is not lost. The children of the ancient ones still walk among us. They are recognizable by their unruly bodies that defy the order of the sun god and moon goddess. They are known by their powerful emotions that can bring forth the rain and shake the earth, a love so strong, it can transform anything. And in our bones, we still hear her song, the song of love, giving us our mission to find one another and reconnect with one another so that the body of love might be whole once more. So, that's a story, and I invite you, if you are so moved, to type one word into the chat or phrase into the chat about how that made you feel, if anything. And if you're like, that was bored, I'm asleep, that's okay too. 
I like to start with stories because I think there's something about metaphor and performance that speaks to us on a different level uh, than like exposition or explanation or teaching. I will tell you a little bit more about myself and why I tell stories like this one. So I'm a writer and a mental health educator for a long time. I was a clinical social worker and I worked with queer youth and their families in downtown Toronto and for a time in, uh, before that in downtown Montreal as well. Um, I currently work as a somatic coach and conflict resolution practitioner. I'm also a transgender woman and I'm descended from the Chinese diaspora, of mixed class background, and I currently live in Toronto, the Dish with One Spoon Treaty territory, as you know already. Um, and I come to you today to share some of the pieces of work that I've been doing and thinking about around conflict and transformative justice, which um, is deeply indebted to the work of Black, Indigenous, POC, and queer communities and thought leaders um, around the world. And I feel myself particularly indebted to, to the thinking of Leah Lakshmi, Piyapsna Samarasenha, uh, Ajara Dixon, Miriam Kaba, Adrian Murray Brown, and other thought leaders in the area of transformative justice um, and uh, queer social justice organizing um, on Turtle Island slash North America today. Um, and what I'm here to talk about is how trauma um, social collapse and conflict come together. And uh, my hope and belief that what we need is a deeper way of pursuing conflict and relationship repair with one another if our movements for social justice are to survive. So I believe that conflict is a spiritual crisis. And <laughs> I know this uh, from personal experience. Maybe some of you also have had experiences where you're working for a nonprofit organization or part of a grassroots social organization um, or doing some other kind of movement or social change building work. And things are kind of good at the beginning. You have like great ideas, people are excited to be there. And then suddenly the differences between us start to uh, break things apart. Someone is unhappy, someone feels exploited or someone has been exploited. Someone says something problematic in some way we come to harm one another. And this is the first kind of rift or rupture in the social tissue that binds uh, social justice movements together. The belief that we won't harm one another or that we've come together to create safe or safer spaces is disrupted by the fact that to be human is to harm. And that by virtue of uh, being conditioned by the mainstream colonial dominant culture, uh, we are going to harm one another, uh, whether or not we mean to. And in that harm comes a shattering. Um, I, would, I would go so far as to call it trauma um, to some extent. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the different definitions of trauma uh, momentarily. Uh, but first I will say, uh, so when that moment happens, when we come to harm one another, our worlds start to fall apart. We get to experience this microcosm of social collapse within our own communities that mirrors in many ways the social collapse that we see going on around us in the larger world today. We start to wonder what our place in the world is. We become angry. We go into our survival instincts and more often. Often than not, we, we start to sesh or to harm one another. And um, it's interesting to note that in social justice movements today, the idea of transformative justice and prison abolition and the abolition of police and the uh, criminal industrial complex um, are uh, popularized or becoming more mainstream. Um, but it's very difficult to actually operationalize these ideas. What would it mean to live without a system of punishment or criminal investigation or police surveillance or prisons um, when the truth is we do harm one another? Um, now, there's a, a longer discussion to be had about how uh, the prison industrial complex and the criminal industrial complex um, are descended from structures that were intended to um, and still are intended to forward the projects of colonial genocide and enslavement. Um, what I, what, I, what I want to talk about more today is, however, uh, that um, those of us who grow up conditioned by the dominant mainstream colonial culture come to absorb the logics uh, of those criminal industrial and prison industrial complexes inside of us. So that even when we decide to reject 
um, prisons as institutions or the police as a body, we still have inside us uh, the knee-jerk instinct to punish um, in order to protect. The idea that if someone harms someone else um, among us or if we harm another person, then the only way to move forward is through punishment or social ostracization or exile. Um, and you know, this is you know, a perfectly reasonable instinct in many ways. When we get hurt, we want to hurt others, or at the very least, we want to make sure that the person who has harmed us is removed from the community. Uh, the question I have is, are there other options? Because as social change makers, or hopeful social change makers, we are trying to build a new world, I believe that we might as well try to build a new world where punishment and exile um, and um, harming one another in the sake of protection or in response to harm um, is not the only option that is available to us. And I would go so far as to say, uh, uh, so far as to say that if we believe that is the only option, then we're never going to actually get to uh, the socially transformed world that we want to see because so much of the mainstream culture is embedded uh, in this framework of punishment. I don't believe we'll ever escape it if we continue to operate from that same framework. And here I'm drawing upon the words of um, Black feminist, lesbian thinker, Audre Lorde, who reminds us that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So I'm going to invite you in the audience to take a long breath in and a long breath out. And to think about someone whom you have some difficulty with, like a problematic fave, you know, not someone who has really intensely harmed you. We're going to save that for another time. But someone you're just like, oh, this person is problematic. And I struggle with them. Maybe it's like a relative um, or a coworker, or maybe it's someone, a roommate, you're someone that you know that irritates you, that you have conflict with, but, you know, not all consuming or over overwhelming conflict. And as you picture this person in your mind, I invite you to notice, um, you know, that the, ex the external part of them, the part that you see is at least um, in some measure, a social role that they wear, a mask, the part of themselves that they bring out into the world to interface with others. Maybe it's the mask of sibling or the mask of uncle or the mask of coworker or the mask of boss. And if you look underneath that social mask, you might notice, you might intuit that in this person, there is also an unwanted part of themselves, the part that they don't wanna be or embody, the part that carries their wounds and their woundings, their past trauma history, and how this part of them is maybe influencing their behavior in some way. And just letting that go and looking even deeper into this vision of the person. We can't really know what's inside a person, of course. We're just guessing and using our intuition here. And noticing that this is a person who also has needs and values and hopes and feelings and goals. Maybe wondering what those might be, coming up with a few guesses, and maybe noticing how those needs, hopes, and values might in some way be connected to the behavior or behaviors that you find irritating, challenging. With a long breath in and a longer breath out, maybe looking even deeper so that you start to lose sight of this person um, in all of their irritating idiosyncrasies. And you notice that this person has a heartbeat. This person breathes like you, their heart beats, like you, they need to breathe. In fact, you're even breathing the same air. And just as you share the need for oxygen, you probably also share these some basic human needs that are noted in conflict resolution literature, which are to know that we are good, to know that we are competent or effective, and to know that we are worthy of being liked or loved. with a long breath in and a long breath out, noticing if this short exercise has in any way impacted the way you feel about this person who is irritating or annoying, it's problematic. Maybe it has and maybe it hasn't. Really, it's okay either way. Um, 
And then you're just taking a moment to notice what might happen if you turned this exercise on yourself. If you took a moment to notice that you breathe, that your heart beats, that as a human, you are worthy of unconditional positive regard, the same human rights as every other human walking around on this planet. Unlike every human, you have needs and hopes and values and goals and feelings, a part of you that carries your wounds and flaws, the parts of you you don't want to be, and a mask you wear over all of that in order to interface with the world around you. So this is a conflict uh, resolution meditation it's based on, that is based on um, the Tibetan Buddhist practice of loving kindness. I've altered it quite a lot. Um, that you might try to use for yourself or you might consider as you know, a potentially interesting exercise or you might just choose to leave it behind. Um, the last step of this uh, exercise that I like to do when I'm using it in a longer and more extended way is to invite people to see if they can notice the best self of the person that they find irritating or that they're in conflict with, or to notice your own best self. Like, really, who are you when your values align with your actions? And who is the person that uh, you're in conflict with when their values align with their actions? And is there anything similar or resonant there? And if there is, particularly within a movement where we know we probably do share some social values or goals, what happens to conflict um, when we say to someone, <laughs> uh, when we say to someone, um, I know you to be courageous, kind, generous, thoughtful. And so I'm asking you to be that way um, when I ask you to consider these other things. So when I speak to, say, I don't know, my relative who is really into Jordan Peterson and doesn't want to use <laughs> like, pronouns, or when I speak to um, like a feminist friend who is kind of going more in like the gender critical direction, what would happen if I said to them, I know you to be compassionate and kind and generous and brave, and I'm asking you to be that way as you consider um, the possibility that, um, that, you, that uh, I might really need to have my pronouns respected, or I might really need to have you consider um, my rights in addition to your rights. And we need to ask ourselves these questions as well, because if we're only just going around telling people, like, I know you're good and please be good, and that just comes off a little preachy, right? But you know, if we're doing it um, of ourselves at the same time, then maybe that shifts the dynamic somewhat. Um, I see someone in the chat has said, I was worried you were gonna say that, turn it on ourselves. Yeah, I mean, that really is my brand. Um, so self-compassion, compassion at the same time. And I think this is um, like an important basis, a spiritual or practice basis of transformative justice that is easy to forget. Um, we can kind of get caught up in um, the like marketing copy of transformative justice, you know, like the idea that TJ or transformative justice is a paradigm of social change making that is rooted in transforming the social conditions that lead to harm. And then we say the names of the people who thought about it, right? Um, and that's theory. Um, that is uh, like, so those are some really important and powerful ideas, but it's one thing to say uh, that we know that police and prisons don't actually end violence in marginalized communities and actually enact violence against us. And it's another to actually be in the body of someone who is harmed or triggered in their trauma um, and has someone in front of us that we need to do conflict resolution with or someone that we need to negotiate um, harm and uh, repair with. And so this is the work that I uh, like am pursuing today and that I invite you to kind of go on a journey with me into um, that uh, transformative justice and the, um, the methodology that I'm working on loving justice and its cousin uh, restorative justice conflict resolution doesn't actually always feel good. Um, in fact, it often feels terrible, sometimes more terrible than continuing conflict in an active or escalating way. Um, and so this image I have before you is like this like kind of like um, visual uh, representation of what I like to uh, perceive or conceptualize as the healing journey or the healing spiral. And this is like um, an image that uh, I was inspired by in this collection, The Revolution Starts at Home, edited by Ching and Chen and Leah Lakshmi, Piyapsa Samara Senha about transformative justice. 
that when we start to think about transformative justice or any kind of healing, that often is pretty stabilizing at first. We're like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> yes, I would like some non-punitive conflict resolution, please. But then we actually have to explore what that means. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes that means, oh my gosh, like I have to stay in community with people who have hurt me, or I might have to stay um, in community with people I know who have harmed others. How do I do that? And then we kind of descend into what I dramatically call the under world, this place of intense social and spiritual crisis where we're like, well, how does, what does that mean? And how do we prioritize the needs of those who have experienced harm? How do we prioritize the marginalized um, while also holding on to this idea that is so um, frequently um, forwarded in transformative justice circles that no one is disposable, that we need every person uh, to change the world. And in that contradiction, um, there can be like a moment of terrible collapse. Um, in that collapse, uh, we can experience personal burnout. I think this is the moment also that a lot of social uh, justice organizations fall apart. A lot of nonprofits find themselves entangled in sort of endless conflict because the truth is I don't think we really do know how to do that, like hold the contradictions that are inherent in our values. Um, and my first uh, suggestion to you around that is that maybe we can just be with the fact that there is a paradox there that um, in trying to deal with external conflicts, conflicts between people, there will inevitably, inevitably be intrapersonal conflicts, conflicts within ourselves, the struggle to know how to hold more than one value or more than one truth at the same time. Um, and when we can do that, maybe that allows us a little more room um, to be kind to ourselves and to be kind to others, to know that we are all experiencing internal contradiction and just trying to figure that out. And when we embrace the shadow of that, that we don't know what we're doing, that being human is to harm and no one is disposable, but also we have to stop harm from happening, then maybe we come up with some different kinds of solutions and are able to reconnect to the life-giving practice that is conflict transformation. So I'm gonna spend just a few minutes going into the notion of trauma and what that actually is. Um, because we talk about it a lot, but I don't think we always have like a sense of what that really is. And it's easy to kind of uh, to relinquish the notion of trauma to the mainstream psychological industrial complex. And I, I like mainstream psychology and psychotherapy. I was a psychotherapist for a long time. But when we focus on like the individual notion of symptoms, trauma as an illness inside the singular body, maybe we miss out on some broader definitions of trauma, like collective trauma. Um, so Kai Erickson, sociologist, was writing as early as 1976 that collective trauma is when I continue to exist, though damaged and maybe even permanently changed, and you continue to exist, though distant and hard to relate to, but we no longer exist as a connected pair or as linked cells in a larger communal body. And so what I think Erickson is pointing to here is in the wake of collective trauma, in the wake of serious pain, like the pain that marginalized communities have uh, have dealt with over the generations, it becomes easy to lose connection to one another. And when I think about my own communities of marginalized folks, racialized people, queer folks, sex workers, I see us turning on one another as though we aren't able to really land in a collective body. When harm happens between us, it wakes up something big inside of our bodies and we're not able to hold that because we are already existing in a state of suspicion toward one another, probably because we have experienced harm from those we loved in the past. So um, in my exploration of conflict, and I think a lot of uh, like, uh, fellow uh, like mental health practitioners and conflict practitioners are looking at this too, um, I took a deep dive into somatic psychology, which is like a popular uh, framework for understanding trauma in the trauma treatment world today. And in somatic psychology, there is a model called the window of tolerance, which is uh, very popularized. It's been adapted here from Pat Ogden and Dan Siegel, both um, a psychologist and uh, medical doctor, respectively. The idea of the window of tolerance is in essence that uh, stress is felt in the body through the nervous system and that each nervous system has within it a certain threshold for stress in which it is able to respond uh, while remaining socially engaged. So still curious about the other, still capable of compassion for oneself and the other at the same time. 
Um, but when triggered past that level of nervous system stress, we can go into what is called hyperarousal, this fight or flight survival instinct where the heart rate is elevated or sweating, and we feel the emotional tone toward panic or rage, this I need to destroy the other or I will be destroyed or I need to get the fuck out of here um, because if I don't, I will be destroyed. And we might also be triggered into hypoarousal, this uh, nervous system survival state where our heart rate is low, our breathing is shallow, and we experience an emotional tone of numbness, depression, or boredom that I don't careness that some of you uh, may notice in people that you're in conflict with, or maybe in yourselves that kind of shut off, I don't care. And um, I'm just disconnected from the situation. I don't want to pathologize survival states like hyperarousal or hypoarousal here. They're very important. And um, actually are like a part of our resiliency. What survival states in the nervous system are not so good at though is maintaining strong relational connection, being curious, asking questions. These uh, like basic skills that we need to resolve conflicts uh, if we want to have relationships that last. So I've adapted the window of tolerance in the loving justice model into what I call the window of transformation. And the window of transformation to me is this place where we're able to be in conflict, um, but still be connected to one another, which is not to say that we have to be in ongoing, unchanging relationship with one another, um, because sometimes part of conflict resolution is letting go of relationship. But still in the navigation or the negotiation of the parting of the separation, um, I believe that there has to be something that is still somewhat connected or connective. Um, as a mediator, I'm learning over and over again that some conflicts uh, cannot be resolved without coming back into ongoing connection. But they often can be resolved um, by saying we part ways respectfully and with integrity. We're gonna hold on to our values about how we wanna treat each other and ourselves as we part ways. And this is a key skill, I think, in marginalized communities where we, everybody knows each other or a lot of us know each other and sometimes serious harms happen. We have to be able to have a way to discuss harm harm and conflict openly um, and maybe come back into relationship, but maybe also part ways and, fi and find that space where we can acknowledge we're not going to kill each other. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have to drive each other out of town. Um, we can deal with conflict, separate, and continue being comrades or continue being um, in some way partnered in the struggle for social justice. Uh, the soul nerve. So. <laughs> Um, if we had more time, I would invite you to an exploration of the vagus nerve or what Resma Menachem, who is a um, Black clinical social worker in the United States um, and author of My Grandmother's Hands, calls the soul nerve, um, and th which is essentially this nerve that passes from the face to the heart to the stomach and in somatic theory is believed to govern our capacity to be in loving social connection with others. So you might just try that now. You might just take in a breath and say, hmm doing a long hum as you exhale, or you might sing or laugh. Any of uh, these practices, singing, laughing, humming, um, can uh, awaken or activate the vagus nerve. And this is basically just an invitation to notice that what you do with your body impacts your body. And if we have certain practices of being connected to our body when we are in moments of conflict, then maybe we're able to shift the way that we do conflict. And so this is actually as simple as something your parent or caregiver might have told you when you were younger. Um, before you scream at someone, take a breath and count to 10. Um, but you know, maybe at the time didn't sound uh, very helpful or maybe it did. Um, maybe you don't wanna take a deep breath and count to 10 there. Maybe there are other things you can do, but the basic idea is to stay in touch with the body and what the body needs in a conflict. In that moment of uh, encountering someone who has caused us harm in community, or in the moment that the rupture happens and a coworker or a friend or family member says or does something hurtful, um, most often a shock goes through the body and that can be felt as pain, it can be felt as numbness, it can be felt as enormous emotion. And what somatic psychology calls us to do is to be aware of what happens in the body, um, which is also the foundation of mindfulness practice. And in being aware, maybe we're able to offer ourselves compassion. And then in so doing, we become able to offer compassion to the other as well. 
So there are many ways of doing conflict de-escalation that are out there. Some of you may have studied nonviolent communication or mediation or alternative dispute resolution. And there are all different methodologies of communicating around conflict. Um, what I've noticed um, in, in my own study is that there tend to be two main ingredients, though, across these methodologies um, for conflict de-escalation. And they are, in some form, compassion and curiosity. And when we bring together compassion and curiosity, we tend to get conflict de-escalation. Not always, it's not like a perfect science, um, but it is an art that we can usually rely upon that when we are in a conflict, compassion and curiosity about the other's position will help bring us into that window of transformation, that's a transformation space, the space where we're able to ask others to change and consider change in our own bodies. Compassion, of course, needs to include self-compassion um, because it's easy to swing to one stream or another. Um, only compassion for myself or only compassion for the other. And the trick of conflict resolution is being able to hold more than one truth at one time. Compassion for the self and compassion for the other. And then bringing curiosity into those edges of compassion, a gentle inquiry about what has gone wrong here? What are the competing needs? What are the competing interests? And how can we meet my needs while also meeting your needs and staying in some form of safe enough relating to one another, even if that means, even if that means growing further apart. This is the last piece of the loving justice model that I will share with you and then I'll break for questions. Um, so when we're able to be compassionate and curious and stay in touch with our bodies, maybe we're able to do conflict in a different way. And this is a practice, somatic psychology, Buddhist mindfulness meditation, and other forms of embodiment practice um, are called practice for a reason. You gotta do them a bunch of times so that you get better and better at them. And no matter how much you practice, there's still going to be moments when we don't get the result that we want. Um, so that's kind of the first suggestion I have is that practice gets us closer to where we wanna be. Um, but then there's the question of what are we practicing and why? It's all very well to bring in compassion and curiosity and body awareness and mindfulness, but why are we doing that? Why do we want to? Um, and so this is the kind of the foundational piece of the loving justice model um, as I practice it and as I'm sort of experimenting with it, um, which is values, like a remembrance of our values and who we want to be in a situation of conflict. This goes again back to that um, practice of looking for your best self or the best self of the other that we started with today. Um, very easy to say, I believe in transformative justice and prison abolition. And then when confronted by a situation of conflict or harm uh, to default to, okay, well, let's just get, you know, the bad person out of here and we'll find someone who is bad and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll assign blame and get them out of here. And of course, uh, the problem with that is when that is the paradigm we live in, nobody wants to be the bad person and everybody says, oh, well, it's, it's the other guy, actually, or it's, it's, the, it's the other person. And so we get, we get trapped in these contradictions of, well, who is, who is the bad person? Um, we have in a lot of feminist and queer communities a saying that uh, we should believe survivors. And I am really into that. I think we should believe survivors. But when the paradigm is one where the survivor is believed and the perpetrator of harm is punished, um, then what's probably going to happen is people will start to compete for the position of survivorhood. Nobody's going to say, I sign up to uh, be punished as a perpetrator. And because we have this uh, paradigm in which we believe survivors, we get caught in kind of another paradox of, well, who do we believe when everybody is claiming to be the survivor? And what I would suggest here is that everybody is a survivor of something. Not everybody is the survivor of harm in a particular situation. There are perpetrators of harm. To be human is to harm. And so when we hold that, we want to remember who do we want to be? What is the kind of world we're trying to build as a community? And if one of the values or some of the values that we have encompass kindness or humility or courage, not throwing people away, then maybe it becomes easier to embrace the reality that we do cause harm as human beings. And uh, if we make, uh, and if we do, if we claim the role of perpetrator of harm, then maybe that becomes more survivable. And then we start to create this other world um, where we don't need punishment, where we're not relying on punishment and fear to stop harm from happening, which as we know, never really worked in the first place. 
Um, and this uh, bec can become the foundation, I believe, of a new form of accountability, where we're creating a community paradigm of accountability that is loving, that holds people in the harm that they do, um, so that uh, they're able to make shifts um, into their window of transformation. We ask them to change, we ask ourselves to change, and we give them the support that we need, that they need to do that, because we all, at some point, need support to become the person that we want to be. I'm going to end this uh, presentation and move into questions with um, a quote that I can never really find the originator of anymore. I heard it at some point in a conflict resolution class, and then I couldn't find the, the originator of it. So if anybody knows, please tell me. Um, like conflict is an inv invitation to transform our worlds. I spoke about conflict as spiritual cr crisis, and I spoke about conflict as trauma earlier. I've experienced it to be both. Um, trauma is a shattering of our expectations of what is safe in the world. And sometimes we come to believe that nothing is safe in the world. Conflict is a shattering of the social bonds around us, the places that we um, imagined or believed or wanted to believe would be safe for us but to be human is to harm and so that's where conflict comes in and we can respond to spiritual crisis and trauma in a number of different ways it would be understandable if we were to say harm has entered the supposedly safer space and so i'm going to respond by fleeing from it or burning it down or uh you know placing the blame on other people or placing it all on myself i'm broken i'm not allowed to be with other humans anymore those would all be really understandable responses I invite us to choose a different one, one where we look at rifts in social relationship as an invitation to find our window of transformation, where we look at conflict as an invitation to transform our worlds. And that doesn't mean that we have to be friends and sing kumbaya and hold our hands, all that kind of stuff all the time. We don't have to stay in ongoing relationship with people who have harmed us, but we might be able to take inspiration from natural world or the spiritual world around us. I think often of, of the starfish when I think about conflict. If the starfish is the body of the community, then conflict can chop a starfish into two halves. And the thing about a starfish is that if you place its two broken halves together, sometimes they will remerge and become a whole starfish once again. But sometimes that doesn't work out. <laughs> sometimes the halves are separated or the damage is too great um, to uh, come back together. But the thing about starfish is that those two separate halves can sometimes grow new arms. And then you have two starfish that are living side by side. And I think this is, for me, one of the biggest learnings uh, I'm discovering about conflict as trauma and spiritual crisis is that you can diverge or you can converge. But either way you do it, you can still seek life and living. So I'm going to end there and go to questions. Thank you, Kai Cheng. Uh, this is such a wonderful and important subject. So I really do appreciate um, the care uh, that you put into today's talk. Um, we do have just a couple minutes just because we do have to kind of break before our, our, our 10, 10 o'clock uh, event. Uh, um, but I, there is one question in the queue that, that also was kind of something that I was thinking about too, is about kind of also the people you were, you talk about people you were in conflict with who are in your life or community, but. Uh, Kai Jacobson here is also asking, you know, I'm wondering if you have any strategies for applying loving justice to online conflicts, especially those situations that involve someone with a large public following, um, but not someone that you have an interpersonal relationship with. Do you have some advice uh, for, for, uh, here? I do. I think this is such a great question because so many conflicts happen online these days. And in many ways, this is just a form of the question that comes up a lot around um, transformative justice, which is what do you do when you are um, like a witness, but not a participant to someone who is in power um, or who has like a, some kind of like following um, who has done things that are bad or, you know, presumably done things that are harmful. And um, that is a form of question of what do we do when we're at the point of a triangle in a conflict, which is to say one person is a in a conflict or has done harm to another person. And then everybody who is witnessing is kind of at this point of the triangle place. And this is a huge um, responsibility actually to be at the point of the triangle, whether it's just one person or an entire community of folks is that um, when we're at the point of a triangle, our own experiences of conflict tend to take over our own past trauma. So we can either respond by being like, oh, no, 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 
that good person is good and we're just going to keep on watching their movies and consuming their media right um kind of paper over the conflict or we could go oh that person is terrible and we're going to destroy them right and that sort of comes from our own um beliefs about what conflict should be now when we're at the point of the triangle though we have a number of different choices and those different choices could look something like um holding the person who survived the harm and making sure that they have the resources they need, often like strictly financial or material in some way, to be safe um, and have what they need to live. And to also ensure that the person who is being um, accused or who's been named as a perpetrator of harm has the resources that they need to self-examine, right? Um, it's very difficult to um, claim the space of repentant perpetrator alone. Nobody really wants to do that. That sounds awful. Um, but when that person has support and encouragement to claim the space of a transforming person or person seeking change in themselves um, in a way that really is loving and not shaming, then maybe we have a, a different option. And also maybe you as a witness don't have the energy for that and you can choose to opt out. So these are just some other ideas of what to do when we find ourselves at the point of a conflict triangle. Thank you, Kai Chang. Um, there's so much more I'm sure we could talk about. It's such a, such a broad topic. Um, unfortunately, we're gonna have to kind of like leave it here, but I wanna invite people to kind of learn more about your work. Where can people find more of your um, kind of maybe, you know, the, these kind of trainings that you have or, or even like your writing? Where would you like people to kind of uh, follow you? Oh, thank you so much for asking. So folks can uh, find me on social media. Um, at Kai Cheng Tom is my Instagram handle. I also have a website and a free workbook, a resource that I've made on conflict that contains all of the concepts here, but like you can go through the much more leisurely uh, fashion. Um, I've dropped a link to that workbook in the chat. Um, and yeah, folks can email me. I don't promise to email back because I have a very full inbox, but I will try my best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Kai Cheng, um, for sharing your talk with us today. Um, uh, we want to everyone to remember to please share your feedback on this session by completing the evaluation form. Uh, Summit 2021 continues with a full day of programming. Um, we'll get back here in about uh, 10 minutes or so, less than 10 minutes. Uh, there's a little bit of a break. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, Kai Cheng, and um, enjoy the rest of Summit. Thank you so much, everyone.